I see we've got 24, 25 people in the room. The numbers are not changing much anymore. So we could probably go ahead and make a start. Okay. So welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to this webinar, um, which introduced the uh, Master of Science in Epidemiology run by Imperial College School of Public Health. Um, I am Marta Blangiardo, I'm a professor of biostatistics within one of the two departments which run the um, master, so the epidemiology and biostatistics department, and uh, I am a, a co-director of the uh, MSc together with Matt Fisher, who is in the other department which run the, the master, which is the infectious disease epidemiology department. And with me, I have uh, Sungano. Sungano, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Marta. My name is Sungano Chigogora, and I am the course organizer and senior teaching fellow on the MSc Epidemiology. Perfect. So um, the idea is to show you something related to uh, epidemiology, and which is obviously the core of the master. And then, and I'm going to do that. And then Sungano is going to go through more kind of like detailed description of the uh, master. Um, so maybe Sungano, if you can move to the next slide. So uh, basically, epidemiology is a very broad discipline, which was born um, really from the pressing need to answer questions related to what is good and what is bad for our health. And we have seen that over and over during the pandemic, scientists, uh, particularly epidemiologists, were in the news and they were asked questions about why did we get a pandemic? How is this pandemic progressing? Why is it worse in specific part of the world? Why some people seems to be more um, susceptible to get more kind of like, uh, you know, sicker and sicker and get to the hospital and die and others were not. And are there um, policies that we can put in place to actually try and curb the spread of the disease and so on? All these are the type of questions we try to answer within you know, an epidemiological framework. And moving away from COVID, this is something that we do every day on any other disease. You can think of, for instance, is air pollution bad for us? Is there a new vaccine for malaria, which is actually better than the previous one or better than you know, having a treatment? Uh, is the diet a specific risk factor for cancer and so on? Uh, Sungana, next slide, please. So in a nutshell, what epidemiology is, is the study of distribution and determinants of uh, health-related conditions, so diseases and more generally health conditions, in specific population. And then is applying this to try to control the health problem. So we're really trying to make sort of like an impact and try to reduce the health burden related to you know, the, the diseases we are studying, and if possible, to kind of like completely you know, eradicate the diseases, that would be the ambition. And as you can, you can imagine, it's really a broad, broad field. So within epidemiology, there are people who look at infectious disease, COVID, HIV, malaria, monkeypox, and so on. There are people who work on non-communicable diseases like cancer, mental health, um, aging, um, anything else that you can think of, which is you know, respiratory diseases and so on. There are people who work on determinants which are environmental determinants, as I mentioned, air pollution, noise, pesticide, health inequalities, trying to understand if kind of like there are some social determinants of health um, and so on. And on top of this, you also need to uh, think that actually there are there is the whole suite of methods that we need to apply to actually answer these questions. So you can think of mathematics, statistics, data science as being an integral part of epidemiology. Next slide, please. So let's go back back in time quite a bit and sort of like think of what is the first example of an epidemiological study. And we are gonna look at John Snow, who was a medical doctor, who was raised in London, and uh, he lived in the 1800s, and he's considered the father of epidemiology. 
So basically what um, he did, he was a very kind of like curious person as most scientists are really. And there was this around 1850, there was this uh, cholera outbreak in London. And most of the scientists, the medical doctors were thinking this outbreak was due to uh, bad, uh, bad uh, air. So kind of like the bacteria was spreading through the air, but he was not really convinced. So what he did, he started gathering some data. So he gathered data on all the cases of cholera and where they were, okay? And he found out that actually they were all around a specific uh, water pump, which is the one you can see on the right, which is still there actually in central London and is on Broad Street. And actually this pump, he realized, soon realized uh, it took, this pump took the water from the Thames, from a specific part of Thames, which was sewage polluted. So actually what he did was use information from the roads, from the water and from the cases to try and answer this question. So getting data, having a question, getting some data using some quantitative method and trying to answer. The question. So it's really, this is the, the first example of epidemiological study. And um, besides being the father of epidemiology, what I would also say is that to me, John Snow is also the father of spatial epidemiology because really he used the map. Uh, he put the cases on the map and trying to use information on the geography to help him answer the question. And this is something it's gonna be, uh, it is included in the, um, in the program if you are interested in looking into that. Next slide, thank you. So over the centuries, epidemiology has evolved and uh, we, um, we, we run epidemiological studies for diff with different uh, aims. The first one is to describe the health status of population. And you can think of that uh, for specific snapshots specifically in time, or actually something which goes in space and time. So trying to understand the, the pattern of specific diseases and how these diseases contribute to the health of the populations and trying to understand when and where things go wrong to try and act very quickly. So in terms of the terms in this type of studies is that of surveillance, epidemiological surveillance. Then the next one um, is to study the history and prognosis of diseases. And you can think of when a disease starts, it's trying to understand how it evolves and how people go from one status being sick to be you know, sicker and sicker and needing to go to the hospital and then maybe dying or actually going into remission. And all this is also part of epidemiology. Yes, sorry. <laughs> and then very importantly to evaluate interventions. Again, we have seen it in the COVID pandemic, how non-pharmaceutical interventions were used to try and curb the spread of disease. So it's really another part which is very crucial within epidemiology is trying to understand if interventions work. And just looking outside COVID, think of the smoking ban as the smoking ban being useful for reducing lung cancer and respiratory diseases. And last but not least, in a, uh, in a etiological perspective to try and answer the question, what is causing a specific disease? And these risk factors could be um, lifestyle risk factors, environmental risk factors, but also very specific and genetic risk factors. So we look at the kind of like continuum, if you want, and the different type of risk factors across you know, the, the life course. Next slide, thank you. So during the course, um, the ambition is for you to develop mastery in methods used to find the causes of health outcomes and diseases in population. And this, um, there are different types of questions we may want to uh, answer. Some are very, very uh, general, like what kind of diseases kill us and make us unhealthy? And what kind of evidence do we have for that? Some are very specific, like related to COVID. Are we going to beat the COVID pandemic? How and where did the monkeypox come from? Some are very related to answering why. So for instance, why life expectancy is different in different parts of the world, or even within the same country, or actually even within the same city. So we can, get, we can, we can answer questions very globally, but also very, very in a very, very detailed space. 
And then what has happened through the centuries, through the years to improve life expectancy and what will happen next? Can we predict? Can we actually you know, predict what's gonna happen? What is gonna be the next challenge? There is climate change is an important one which we are just really scraping the surface. And this is something we can also look at in epidemiology and you know related to the um, health of people the health of animals the health of the ecosystem in a one health perspective and finally what about medicines and drugs and treatment how do we know that this treatment works how do we know a specific treatment is better than another one next please so if you join the program, you are going to be um, in one of the leading world, uh, world leading institution and the world leading department, the School of Public Health. As I mentioned already, there are two departments which mainly run the program, um, the Infectious Disease Department and the uh, Epidemiology and Biostatistics, Infectious Disease Epidemiology Department and the Epidemiology and Biostatistics Department. And these two departments are really at the core of decision making. And this was very clear during the COVID pandemic, the infectious disease epidemiology department, in particular, Neil Ferguson, the head of the department, were really advising the government in terms of decision to be made to actually curb the spread of the disease. So there was a lot of work going on there, which was really, really impactful. And on the other hand, also from the um, epidemiology and biostatistics department, the head of the department was leading the uh, REACT study, which was a randomized survey to actually estimate the prevalence of the disease at very um, time, um, high ta temporal resolution. So there was a lot going on during the COVID pandemic. But it's not only about the COVID pandemic, our research is impactful you know, on any level. So if you go to the next slide, Singana, please. We, um, and one example is the monkeypox. When the monkeypox outbreak came out last year, um, there was a consortium which was put together and the people, uh, researchers from the infectious disease epidemiology department were part of this consortium to try again and advise decision makers about how to treat the pandemic, not the pandemic, sorry, how to treat the outbreak, not the pandemic, how to treat the outbreak and how to actually try to uh, reduce the burden. Um, next slide. And on the other hand, the work of the, which is going on within the um, epidemiology and biostatistics department has informed the decision in terms of air pollution and in terms of noise. Air pollution, the research has gone into the chief medical officer report saying that actually long-term air pollution is really bad for health. And also um, uh, researchers from the department have advised the um, mayor for London um, about the ultra low emission zone and expanding the ultra low emission zone to try and clean the air of the capital. And finally, um, there was some work around noise pollution and we informed the decision and the debate around uh, building a third runaway at Heathrow Airport. Next slide, please. So you see, and hopefully I'll, I'll give you very quickly a flavor of how um, diverse, how um, wide epidemiology can be. And here is just the keywords of all the research which goes on into the two departments um, which I mentioned. And this is something that you're gonna have the opportunity to explore during the course. Um, and the ambition is to give you really the methods to make you leaders in epidemiological research. And then it's for you to decide what is, you know, what it is the area which interests you the most to maybe go into your research um, summer project. So you can have something around the modeling, mathematical, statistical modeling, something related to infections or outbreaks, something related more to non-communicable diseases, as I mentioned, mental health, cancer, 
uh, health inequalities, environment, and also with this idea of impact and this idea of uh, engaging with uh, uh, public health community. I think it's, I leave the floor to. Sorry, you stop, Marta. Well, thank you for very much for that overview. Um, I'm now going to talk about the MSc epidemiology in more detail. So I said I'm the course organizer and I'm involved in the day to day running of the program. And I'd like to share with you information about how what you should expect of the MSc when you join Imperial. Um, there's quite a bit of information on our MSc epidemiology course page, and you're also welcome to contact us via email. This is the email address that's on the website, MSc epidemiology, if you have any additional queries. So anything that we don't address in this webinar or anything that you'd wanted to ask anyway, um, do please feel free to contact us. So first, the structure. The MSc epidemiology is a one-year full-time program. And it's quite an intensive program. Uh, you should expect to spend most of your time in this one year working on your MSc uh, coursework or preparing for assessments. So in class or, or carrying, conducting some independent work. In term one, you will have a core introduction to epidemiology. And this is through four compulsory modules. I'll talk about those in detail in the next couple of slides. You'll also have some optional math se sessions in case you need some refreshers, as well as some uh, statistics masterclasses, also optional for you to attend in case you also need to brush up on those skills. But the compulsory sessions or modules that you need to attend are four in that first term. In term two, you uh, will be expected to develop some advanced skills through elective modules. And uh, you can take a, any combination of these out of the nine or 10 modules that we'll have an offer for you next year, as long as they add up to 30 uh, credits, 30 ECTS. And I'll show you the elective modules that are available to you next year. Finally, in term three, which is the summer term, you will be completing an independent research project supervised by academics in SPH. And this is the crux of your whole MSc learning. This is where you get to apply all of your the core skills that you learn in term one and the advanced skills in term two on your own independent research project. So we do ask that you start thinking about the research project as early as possible, even now if you're able to think of what you might want to work on. And I'll give you some pointers on how you can get started on thinking about this by pointing you to our research groups and the type of work that's being done at Imperial. Because importantly, you should only work on a research project that can be supervised by academics at Imperial. And we'll start working with you in, in term one on potentially developing a research question. But of course, we'll also avail projects to you in term three. But it's always easier and better for you if you work on something that you're passionate about, that you can start working on from start to end in term one. So this is how course material is delivered through the year. And we now have, uh, particularly since the lockdowns eased, a process of an approach to course material delivery through this blended uh, learning approach. So you have asynchronous material delivered online, which you can engage with at, at your own time, and which normally takes the form of readings, uh, lectures, videos that you can watch, and quizzes and other interactive materials that are available on Coursera or Blackboard, which are virtual learning environments. This is followed by in-person small group tutorials and some in-person lectures as well. So there's a combination of in-person lectures and tutorials on campus. And you would have a clear structure of what these will look like for each of the modules. And you'd expect to said to spend some independent time going through the asynchronous material and then spending quite a lot of the day um, on campus in class, going through some additional lectures and uh, interactive tutorials. That will be the case through, through term one and term two for all the taught classes. And then in the summer term in term three, you will have optional summer sessions. And these are normally delivered bi-weekly, although we have quite a lot of additional sessions for stats support. Um, but all of these are, are optional. You don't have to attend anything in term three except for your supervision meetings with your supervisors every two weeks. But we do encourage that you attend these summer sessions, which are prepared to help you with uh, the, your literature review, your write-up, your presentation preparation for your final viva. There are various aspects aspects of this that we've thought through carefully and uh, prepared these support sessions for you to attend through the summer. 
Uh, you will also have through term, from term one uh, and two, some additional optional sessions that you can attend, similar to the optional sessions that you have in the summer period, uh, but they take a different form in that in term one, you have got um, optional seminars and uh, a disease masterclass online course, some MOOC, as well as some research seminars in the de different departments that we invite you to attend. Um, although you're invited to attend these seminars, it's not always guaranteed that you'll be able to attend because most of these seminars are prepared for staff, by staff, but students are most welcome to attend those. There will be opportunities if you'd like those as well for you to develop student-led seminars. So there are a lot of these seminars in term one and in term two, and most right now are online, although some are in person, and there's been a lot of effort made to make these hybrid so that they're delivered on campus, but you also can join them online. So that's, that allows a bit more flexibility when the tech allows. So currently we had in term one a seminar series that we invited students to that is led by the disease of uh, the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology. And then in term two, students are invited to join the Epi and Biostats journal club meetings. So those are the sort of op optional seminars that you can expect to attend, but do consider that you would have a lot of work to do. I, I can't stress more how intensive the program is. Uh, these are the modules that you have in term one, and they add up to 30 ECTS, which is the European Credit Transfer System. You'll have the, an, introduction, an introduction to statistical thinking and data analysis, principles and methods of epidemiology, research methods, where you cover both quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods of research, and finally, an introduction to infectious disease modeling. All of these are 7.5 ECTS modules. And I said, you have the added value, non-credit bearing seminars and tutorials to attend if you would like and have the time. In term two, you can select up to five or six modules as long as they add up to 30 ECTS. So term one should add up to 30 ECTS. Term two is an additional 30 ECTS, which is made up of any of these uh, modules that are on the slide. You can see the largest of these is the Bayesian modeling for spatial and special temporal data, which runs over a 10 week period and that carries 10 ECTS. All of the other modules here run over five weeks and carry five ECTS. Yes. So you have a block at the beginning of term two, and immediately after that, beginning a, begin a second block of modules without a break in the second half of term two. So you will have three blocks or periods, depending on how you choose to uh, organize your modules or which modules you select. So just running through these in case you haven't read through it. We've spoken of the Bayesian, you've got advanced regression, further infectious disease modeling, which is a prerequisite for outbreaks. Uh, you've got emerging and neglected tropical diseases, which is quite popular, genetics of infectious disease pathogens, molecular and genetic epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, and nutritional epidemiology. The last two on the screen are pretty new. This is their second year running, and these are also quite popular. So I think that it tends it winds up being that there is a balance of interest across all of the elective modules and you won't not have a place on any of the modules that you're interested in so there's no scramble for places even though i've mentioned some is popular uh, we have a balance of numbers on each of these modules just dependent on your interests you don't have to make any combinations you don't have to combine uh, or organize any of these electives in any particular order except for the um, FIDM and outbreaks, where FIDM is a prerequisite for the other. And uh, how you wind up combining these depends on how the schedule is set up and if you're able to attend uh, your chosen modules, because some fall on the same day, unfortunately. I'll show you what this looks like in a, a slide to come. Term one is quite straightforward. That's easy to follow in terms of uh, where each module falls. Each module has got a specific day that it uh, takes place. So that's the delivery of the course material on campus. The independent studying you can do on any day of the week, as long as you've done any prerequisite reading or watched any lectures before the in-class session. All of Mondays for intro to stats, all of Tuesdays for principles of epi. Uh, and as you can see, that follows the same order up to Friday where you have a full day of infectious disease modeling. Um, you should expect to spend a full day in class uh, on the Monday and Friday, particularly. Those are quite intensive practical days. Uh, and at least half the day, depends on 
which week on, on the different weeks. You can expect to spend half the day or to three quarters of the day on campus for principles and methods of epidemiology and the research methods. You're given some free time uh, in research methods to work on your group work. This is what term two looked like this year. There's going to be some reordering of this, uh, particularly I think the genetics of infectious disease pathogens is going to move from the Tuesday to another day in the week, not Monday, because as you can see, Monday is uh, dedicated to Bayesian modeling for spatial and spatial temporal data all through term two. Um, as I had explained earlier, you have a, a, an a first and a second block of term one and two, where you can see the modules that I'd already spelled out to you, uh, spelled, uh, detailed in this table. So emerging and neglected trop tropical diseases, for instance, will take place in the first five weeks of term two. And if you've selected this and then advanced regression, you will go straight to advanced regression in the next five weeks uh, until the end of term two. So just have a look at this for a second and see how you might be able to organize your modules if selected. And take note that some of these fall on the same day as I mentioned. So for instance, this year, molecular and genetic epidemiology uh, on the Friday takes place at the same time as nutritional epidemiology. So you wouldn't be able to take both those modules. You'd have to select one of the two. I hope that is clear and I will we'll describe this in more detail again once you join us so that you um, have a good chance to think about the electives that you want. We have a session where we'll go through the same table and also get uh, meetings or get uh, an introduction to all of the module leads where they'll talk to you about what to expect. In term three, you have a full four months to work on your research project. And so term three is a full another full 30 ECTS. And I said, this is the core module that you have for the whole masters. And it's the only core module on this MSc. And it should reflect all of the learning that you have uh, completed in term one and two. To help you start thinking about your research projects and what the supervision might look like, I prepared this slide that shows the different research departments that we have in the School of Public Health. So Marta mentioned that uh, this MSc is run by the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, that's the third column to the right, and those are the studies that are conducted in, in the, that department, as well as um, epidemiology and biostats next to it, which is uh, where you've got some of the cancer and CBD epidemiology, biostats, genetics, and a combination of some of the other types of studies conducted in other uh, research departments. I've included all of the, the departments in um, the School of Public Health because we actually have contributions to teaching from all of these departments. And you're also welcome to take a project and complete a project that is under supervision by any of these departments. So you can look at work that's being done, for instance, with the Environmental Research Group who lead a module in term two on this MSc and an additional one on the MPH and usually provide quite a lot of project support in term three. So if you're interested in environmental um, epidemiology, which is also something that's within the remits of epidemiology and biostats, have a look at the, the research topics that are actually being covered by each of the research teams that's there. And this can be an intensive process of just reviewing the course pages, but I think it's really beneficial and I'd encourage it so that you get a good idea of what uh, the research topics that are being conducted look like and start to think of what you might be interested in researching and start formulating a research question, knowing that you will have people in the department that are able to support and supervise that project. And we're quite proactive in helping you link up with supervisors for your projects. For instance, through term one this year, we've had a few projects on the MSc who've gone on to develop their own um, projects, one of which Marta is supervising. Um, the second one that's being supervised by Professor Maria Gloria Bassanez on the Emerging and Neglected Tropical Disease module. So that sort of supervision and processes are open to you and it's just your will and effort that counts there. You could wait until term three, uh, at which point all of these research groups submit their own projects that they've developed and you can choose one from there, but you can't be guaranteed that there'll be one that you will find interesting but this is an idea to start working on as you think on what your year will look like. So this is a summary of what I've just said actually on the last slide. You will have the compulsory modules to start developing your skills and methods 
methodology, at which time you also start thinking on your research question, considering the range of research groups that we've got available. And then you go into the period of electives where you refine certain skills that you might find useful for working on your research project. Because as you can see, the research project is the final goal here. We're trying to train you to be uh, researchers in epidemiology. And the project period starts with the background reading, um, and initial meetings with your supervisor, start working on your draft and uh, working on the research itself, then uh, completing the research and analysis and start preparing your presentation and com complete a, a full draft to the supervisors by August and also uh, work on the final preparation for your Viva presentation, which takes place in September. After this period, we also, uh, we look at the projects and all the project marks from the different elements of uh, that module, which is the research project module. And you will have, uh, there is a, an opportunity to receive a prize for your dissertation. So that there is one prize given to the best submission and you're encouraged to go on and publish. And you can also use this work that you have done, which is an independent piece of research, to support your skills as a researcher in any career endeavors that you have. So you would highlight all of this, the steps that you've taken to show your suitability for any research roles that are to come. Um, this is an example of some of the summer projects that have been conducted or completed by students, and these are from last year. Uh, and it, I tried to include a mix of projects uh, from the different departments. Um, the ozone would have been the EBS or ERG. And a couple of those EBS and the infectious disease epidemiology group. And then the final one is smoking behavior was from primary care and population health. So these were submitted by the supervisors. And then at the bottom, you have student-led projects where students developed their own research questions. Um, and here, one student wanted to work in um, HIV epidemiology, was coming in from South Africa, uh, asked us how to get in touch with the supervisors in that area, which was easy enough because actually one of the crew supervisors is the module lead on intro to stats. And they developed this project on finding the optimal balance of HIV testing, which um, has led them to a post within the department with their supervisor as a research associate currently. And clearly, the, this is something that's of interest to them, and I anticipate that they'd continue working in this field. Uh, the second project was also developed by a student, and they uh, initiated contact with collaborators in Italy at the London School of Hygiene with support of, with support from their supervisors as well. They have supervision here at Imperial and they've carried on from the MSc to work on the same a similar uh, permutation or an advance on this same project, uh, which they're working on for their PhD currently at the London School of Hygiene, but with co-supervision by their MSc supervisor here at Imperial. So these are projects that they started in term one through their assessments on the research methods module, carried through, all to, through to the end of term two and three, submitted their projects and are still working on this was just a representation of what you should expect and what you should anticipate to do. So I can't encourage you more to start thinking about what sort of research you want to work on, and we'd be here to support you in doing that. So uh, the skills that we want to engender in you are this are as already kind of muted this ability to design and construct and conduct your own research interpret it, communicate it. So there are various elements of what we've included in the course on the technical skills, as well as critical thinking and the ability to communicate findings, to present your findings through group, uh, through the, the group work tasks that we have for you and independent, oh, sorry, individual presentations as well. Uh, the ability to work in teams and um, just be a, a rounded researcher by the time you leave this intensive MSE. Uh, most of our students go on to uh, complete doctoral training, so they join PhD programs and quite a lot of the students that we had in the MSc since I started are in the department completing their PhDs or are in completing their PhDs in other institutions that I know of, and I'm still in touch with most of those. 
um, around this time of year is when most PhDs would have started recruiting. So I already know that most of cohort that we had in we we have um, this year have applied for PhDs because we had deadlines in December, January. So most of those would have made their intentions clear. So this is what I'd expect most of you might be interested in, but that's not the only route. Uh, but I, I do anticipate that most people that come to complete this P, this MSc intend to pursue a career in research, which normally goes through this route of completing a PhD. Although some complete their research in different um, organizations such as NGOs, pharmaceuticals, we have a lot that go on to do to be public health analysts or work as epidemiologists in pharmaceuticals, which if that's something that's of interest to you, um, I do know a lot of students and have ended up in those positions. We host career seminars through the year where we ask former students to come and speak to you and share their experience. So they come and talk to you about uh, what they were doing around this time or at whatever time they come and present to you to prepare for their future careers, what's helped, what barriers they faced and sort of give you tips on how to get to the positions that they currently in and I tend to have people that are working within uh, uh, UK HSA or which is what was listed there as Public Health England it's not the name anymore and the different pharmaceutical organizations um, and local government whatever roles of participants that are interested in coming and sharing their experience and they're normally quite forthcoming with that. So applying for the MSc Epidemiology this is a normally quite competitive process and we get quite a lot of applications. And I think on balance, this is still the case that we we're getting about 200 to 300 applications for 25 to 30 places. So it is highly competitive. And we aim to review applications within four to six weeks. I think we're working on a batch received from the beginning of February. So we're currently on target, maybe one or two from late January. But I anticipate that if you applied in February, you'd be getting your decision soon, if not already. And if you applied up to December, January, most of those decisions have gone out. So we are on target for the four to six week review of applications. And we have a rolling application period up to May, June, although we've had to close quite early in the last couple of years because of demand, because the places were taken up. So if you're interested in applying, I would encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Because we are actually currently very close to our target. Uh, the minimum requirements for this program are a two one, degree, two one degree or above, so that's an upper second class degree or equivalent, depending on where you are, in any of those subjects in mathematics, stats, medicine, or anything related to the biological sciences. Uh, this is not a rigid requirement in terms of the subjects. If you feel that your undergraduate links to epidemiology and uh, you can highlight other skills that you developed and interests that make you a good candidate for this, you're most welcome to apply. And a 2-1 degree does not guarantee that you will get a place. There are a lot of factors to consider, such as how uh, motivated you are to study uh, on the MSc and your suitability based on all, all the documents that you submit to us. So if you have a 2-1 degree and also spell out well in your personal statement how you suit the course and um, have demonstrated activities that show your suitability for this, the, the demands of this course, then you would get a place. But it's not guaranteed that just because you have a 2-1 degree, you'll get a place. Um, demonstration of quantitative skills is useful because this is quite a quantitative uh, program is quite demanding in that, particularly in term two, although you get a preparation or an introduction to this in uh, intro to stats and infectious disease modeling. Uh, we'd expect that you write, you know, that you put quite a bit of effort in writing a personal statement because it's very hard to select from that many candidates if you can't pick a story or identify a story uh, behind the application. So find a person behind uh, a submitted application. So work out on the personal statement and compile a persuasive statement demonstrating why you're suitable for the program and how we can support you in developing your future skills. Because it's that's also really helpful for us to know that where you're the right person for the program and we'd be, help, we'd be able to help you in reaching your future goals. Um, a detailed CV is required, also showing all of these relevant um, activities and skills. And 
we expect a higher level score of uh, English language. So for the IELTS, that's a score of at least seven of a, or above for the overall test and 6.5 for each element. And I'd ask that you go to the Imperial website to check which other scores are permitted and what level you need to score it to achieve this higher requirement. And we also need two strong references, one, from, one of which must be from um, an academic, one of which must be an academic reference. Um, I updated this earlier on today, so hopefully there are not any typos. I'm sorry, forgive me for that if there are any, but I, I recognized or was advised that there are a lot of new scholarships. And this is normally something that comes up in our question and answer about the sources of funding. And I'd ask that you check the Imperial website for details of this, but we historically have had one MSc Epidemiology Scholarship, which was a whole, full home tuition. And this is open to home or overseas students, but only covers the home part of the fee. So 13,000 it was up to. And then there was there were several deans scholarships up to 10 across the faculty, uh, which offer up to 10,000 pounds. In addition to that, there are several new uh, scholarships that are listed on there, which are three Bseisu and Imperial scholarships and one Shevni Bseisu, which are for candidates who are citizens of Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, and who are normally resident there. These cover full tuition. There is a presidential scholarship for a student of black heritage, and this also covers a full home tuition plus a generous stipend. Eight great imperial scholarships, which cover up to 10,000 pounds for students of those countries listed there. Uh, you would need to top up the other amount for the international fees. Then there is one sanctuary scholarship, which is a full scholarship uh, for a a candidate that identifies or is identified as a refugee or it qualifies under other humanitarian criteria, please have a look at the website for what those criteria are. And then there's a, another scholarship that only covers accommodation and see Grim is new, up to £10,000. Um, additional information about all, all of these scholarships are available, additional information is available on the fees and funding page for scholarships and should also be on the SPH page. Not absolutely certain of this as we've just uh, had new versions of our websites published. There is additional funding beyond Imperial and you can look at your national and international lists of scholarships. And for the UK, you can get a, a UK master's loan, but this is open to UK nationals only. I think there is additional information. I just couldn't make this any more comprehensive this morning. So I think uh, as I'm going to the end of our presentation and talk, and I think we're still in time for some questions if you have any, I would recommend that you have a look at some of these publications as preparation for your time with us. Uh, there's some exciting readings that could give you an idea of how epidemiology is and has been used. Uh, the, the most recent talk that we actually had in-house uh, at Imperial was by Professor Spiegelhalter, um, who also has a related podcast. Uh, so he's got the, the book on the art of statistics and the, the podcast that's actually quite riveting that you can follow on how statistics is used in the real world. There is the Fair Society Healthy Lives Report, report which is the Mammoth Review, which has uh, received more prominence or prominence of late because there is now a greater understanding of what our fair society affects lives. Um, I find this casual inference podcast quite interesting. Uh, it's quite laid back, casual as they say, but it's about causal inference. In, and it's about looking or investigating causality in research. And it's really exciting when you consider how things that you take for granted in considering that A causes B within epidemiology, there are very precise and specific ways of ensuring that what you're reviewing is a causal relationship or what you've found is a causal relationship. And more of you might know about Bad Science by Ben Goldacre, who also very recently gave a really interesting, like a riveting talk uh, at one of our Imperial events. So this is something that you can look forward to events by uh, highly notable published uh, academics or eminent academics, such as this by Ben Goldacre. And most recently, uh, he, he was talking about bad, bad, bad Science, but also some of his other publications and work that he's been, been doing with um, more globally. So 
just look out for all of these interesting sources of additional information on how epidemiology is used in the real world. So this is some, uh, what I would suggest as exciting reading for the summer before you start with this in October. So yeah, this is the end of our presentation or webinar to you. As said, you can contact us through this email, msc at imperial.ac.uk. And you can look for more information on MSC on the website. Um, anything that's not there, most welcome to contact us and ask. So I think at this point, we're going to go into the Q&A and address any questions. From how I understand it, you're posting questions in the chat. And uh, our team members are answering those, or have been answering those live. So I don't know if you've spotted any that have not been answered that need to be addressed live. There are three, Sungana, I think. OK. There is one. What kind of jobs do former yes, graduates which is something Sungano, yeah, yeah. you have already covered, I think. Yeah, so this is something that I've addressed. And we try and get uh, students to, so most recent former students to come and talk to you so you can get something to that you can easily relate to on how they've gone from where you will be sitting to a role in the UKHSA, for instance, or working in the NHS, or working in a research assistant role in academia. So those are the common types of jobs that we had going into PhD. We have a PhD session, so a dedicated session on what PhD opportunities are available and how to apply for those. And we invite current PhD students to come and speak to you about these. One of our students from last year has got the president's scholarship for their PhD. So they're completing their PhD, which is fully funded. Um, and they're an international student and that's been fully funded for them to complete this. And this was based on a project that they completed um, in their MS, MPA. I'm sorry, the MSc, sorry, with supervisors in PCPH is what I wanted to touch on. So this student was completing a project on diet and beverages with supervision from primary care and population health. And they're now completing their PhD in that department, fully funded. How hard is it to find a job? So these are things that are job related. In the current climate, I don't believe it is that difficult. It's up to you what you're interested in. And uh, if you want to start with a career that, that has a PhD at the front of it, what might be slightly challenging is finding the PhD funding that suits what you want to do, but it's not impossible. There are a lot of funds out there. Did you want to add anything to that about careers, Marta? I would say that I think there is shortage and is recognized that there is shortage of quantitative epidemiologists, uh, you know, which who really know sort of like their stats, their maths, which is exactly what the master is teaching you. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, anticipate that actually you have issue, issues finding a job. It's obviously a lot depends on what you want to do. And, you know, obviously, if you want to go into the academic career rather than if you want to go into the sort of like a pharma or you know into sort of like a, a more organization like which could be like the, the UKHSA or sort of like health protection agency or you know some CDC for instance in other countries it's um, it's obviously different you need you need to decide what's you, you know what's the path you want to follow but then I don't think it's it's it would put you, this master, I think, put you really on the map quite nicely to get, you know, a good job once you know exactly which direction you want to take. I think through term one, we had two recruitment opportunities through former students, one who's now in a pharmaceutical agency in Europe, and they have a graduate program where they'd asked her to contact us to create an opportunity for them to advertise this graduate program. So they did that. And um, I've more recently re received something from a student who's working with, for a consulting firm who would like to recruit from us. And we have a similar thing with other students from previous years. So I, I, I don't anticipate that finding jobs would be a struggle. Uh, this is an interesting question, the one that's still left on there or on are there any courses or research opportunities for non communicable diseases and I think something that we probably should touch on in relation to our course content. Yes, so I think within the course, I can say that actually there is quite a lot on non infection diseases so non communicable diseases, uh, the, the list of courses, the list of modules that Sungano 
put and went through with you uh, had something like environmental epidemiology, nutrition, um, nutrition epidemiology, um, genetic on some uh, some, some levels actually can, can cover both infections and non-infectious diseases. So really, you know, it can be both. The, uh, the course on Bayesian analysis, again, it can cover kind of like both. But I would say, so basically bottom line is we, cover a lot of both infectious and non-infectious diseases. And even in terms of summer project, there is a rich opportunity for um, non-communicable diseases uh, related project. So it's really uh, up to, you know, again, to you to decide exactly what's, what's your path is. And even within non-communicable diseases, as I mentioned, it means you know, non-communicable diseases is a big thing. <laughs> as well as just paying infectious diseases, right? So you can look at cancer, you can look at inequalities and life expectancy more generally, you can look at uh, mental health, uh, respiratory disease, as I said. So it's really, um, there is an opportunity. I'm not saying, you know, every year we have project on all of this, but definitely we have a pseudo project which kind of like cover non-communicable disease yes. epidemiology. And having said that, as Sungano said, there's always the opportunity to build up your own project. So you're, if you're interested in non-communicable disease epidemiology, and you know it from a start and you identify a disease that you're particularly interested in or a question, a research question you're interested in, you can tailor and you start build, building your research project based on that. Thank you. I think I, I would add that, that uh, there seems to be a, a slight leaning, say slight, quite a large leaning towards uh, infectious disease epidemiology in our modules and in our course content. This is because the, the course was historically mostly on infectious disease epidemiology. It was developed in the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, but it spanned out a little bit more to include opportunities for anyone that would like to cover other areas. And also because there's now uh, involvement by uh, individuals from other departments, there's a greater representation now from EBS, for instance, through Marta as the course director, core course director and also uh, involvement by individuals in the environmental research group. So there, there is more uh, exposure to non-communicable diseases and more interaction with primary care and population health for supervision of projects uh, of interest to you. But the, the co course content still has that leaning you'll identify towards um, infectious disease modeling. So I think all of the questions that were there have been covered. What is the time? It's five minutes to two. I mean, do please feel free to ask any more questions if you've got any. Um, stay here for a few minutes, but if then no more, we might actually end this a minute or two early. I don't know. I guess now might be a time actually to highlight something that was mentioned earlier um, about our move to the new campus in White City. So we're currently based at St. Mary's, that's where the department home is um, for infectious disease epidemiology and that's where also EBS was based. But now we've started to migrate to our new campus at White City. This is for the course teams, the researchers and um, instructors on the MSc. However, based on uh, most of the teaching rooms and um, requirements for each of the modules varying in terms of the, the spaces that they need to teach, you should expect to have most of your teaching at the different locations across SPH. You won't necessarily be just based at St. Mary's. Actually, this is unlikely because of the, the growing cohort sizes across the different programs. And this year, from experience, most lectures have actually taken place at South Kensington in term one, maybe a few more in term two at St. Mary's. And there are quite a few as well, particularly, I believe, for the research methods module and some of the other modules on the MPH that take place closer to the PCPH, like the MPH home department, which I mentioned earlier, primary care and population health, and that's based in Charing Cross. So expect to go to any of these campuses. And as we have the new building open, uh, this will this migration will take place once you join us. If you're considering things like accommodation, do note that your, your lectures will be in the 
different campuses, South Kensington, Charing Cross, White City, St. Mary. It seemed nothing new has come up uh, while I was talking through the campus locations. What do you think, Mato? Should we end? Yeah, and I can see that uh, attendees are starting to leave. So I think maybe it's the natural. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I suppose we've addressed everything in quite sufficient detail. So um, we hope you enjoyed the webinar and found it useful. Uh, but I'll hand over to you, Marta, to close the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Hopefully this has been uh, informative and um, we hope to see some of you, uh, some at least some applications from you and then possibly some of you uh, from September uh, joining us and uh, having a year of uh, great research and learning. And I think that's it. You're most welcome. Thanks. Bye. Bye.